Hey, Cypher here. It's been a while since I did an episode in my California history series. That's because I had to do a lot of research. We're past the time frame that I specialize in. Plus, with all the other stuff I've got to read, it's difficult to make time. But at long last, I've completed another one. Another one. This is actually episode 10 of the California series, and if you'd like to go back and watch that stuff, click here. You don't actually need to see that stuff, but it's worthwhile if you haven't. There's only a couple left, I think. So anyways, let's talk about how California went from being the fulcrum of the American Southwest to the most powerful state in the Union. Thanks to my patrons, especially Kevin Butler and Lana Golikova, as well as Babbel. It's an app that can get you up and speaking a new language in just three weeks. In the history profession, speaking multiple languages is almost a necessity. Ich spreche Deutsch, aber sehr schlecht. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich meine Sprechprüfung bestanden habe. Aber Deutsche habe ich nur wegen meiner Familie gelernt. I could do well to brush up on my German, but I actually need to get my Spanish better because of studying U.S. borderlands here in the Southwest. I like to say I'm fluent in Google Translate, but that certainly doesn't convey the cultural and conceptual discrepancies between the languages. So I've started brushing up on my Spanish, and Babbel is a great tool specifically for that. Unlike other language learning apps, it has a special emphasis on cultural implications of languages. They have a variety of ways of learning, from going through realistic conversations, descriptions of technical rules like conjugation, playing mini-games, and listening to podcasts. No hablo espanol, pero estoy aprendiendo. And you can too, by going to the link below, which will give you 65% off your subscription, and they've got a 20-day money-back guarantee. Muchos gracias, and on with the show. From California's start as a state in 1850, she dominated the Southwest and even much of the Northwest. The compromise of that year centered on Californian statehood. Compromise of 1850. Which dictated the destiny of all the surrounding territory. Transcontinental Railroad's final destination was California. In many ways, Americans expanded eastward from there, rather than westward. Nevada, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico were dependent on capital flows that originated in the Golden State. Even today, California anchors the Southwest. But prior to World War II, California was essentially the hub for Eastern capital to extend wealth into the Southwest. It was more of an interior colony than a state of its own. But throughout the late 19th through mid 20th centuries, that changed. Eventually, California became an economic power to rival the East and eventually surpass it. Now, the state alone could be the fifth largest economy in the world and has 10 million more people than the closest populated state. Plus, contrary to popular belief, it's still growing with no state anywhere close to capable of challenging that prosperity. Alongside this transition, Southern California overtook the northern half, making Los Angeles the cultural capital of the United States. This was not a steady change, but one fraught with bumps and troughs, incidents and accidents, booms and busts, all of it driven by the railroad. By 1878, Californians were sick of the Southern Pacific controlling their state. Too many politicians were under their control. So a new constitutional convention met in Sacramento to create a significantly amended constitution, reaching ratification a year later. But this did nothing to curb the power of railroad interests. The Santa Fe Railroad finally gained access to Los Angeles down the Cajon Pass in 1885. This led to massive competition between the SF and SP until they got down to only a dollar for travel from Chicago to LA. By 1900, LA gained 400% of her former population. Fruit growers took advantage of the empty trains going the other direction. Soon came an oil boom on top of it. So LA remained the fastest growing city in the US until World War II, only being overtaken by Albuquerque, which I have a video on that. 
With all these people coming to California, massive infrastructure projects had to be undertaken in order to water and power such a boom. Los Angeles used its railroad access to control resources and absorb neighboring cities. To stop this onslaught, fruit growers in the southern part of LA County banded together to create Orange County in 1889. My great-great-grandfather was one of the signatories, but most people were unable to escape LA's insatiable demands. They used so much of their water that the once overwhelming LA River, which often overflowed its banks, is now nothing but a trickle down a concrete wash. They turned to resources outside their valley, looking far north to the Owens Valley. After much legal conniving and wrangling, they finished an aqueduct in 1913. But even that wasn't enough for the perpetually dry Southern California. The Imperial Valley was taking enough Colorado River water to concern the rest of the Southwest. So they all came together in 1922 to forge a compact governing the use of that water, giving the plurality of it to California. This also set forth the plans for regulating the Colorado, which would result in the famous dam named after the chief engineer of this plan, Herbert Hoover, who happened to be a professor at Stanford for many years and was the president of the United States when the dam began building. Los Angeles and San Diego would eventually build aqueducts across the Mojave to gain access to that water as well. But these kinds of massive infrastructure projects came at a cost, not just monetarily, but in lives and ecology. In 1905, the Colorado River canals to the Imperial Valley silted up and overflowed, dumping almost all of the water from the river into the Mojave Desert, gathering in a sink and forming a brand new lake. For a few decades, the Salton Sea was actually a good resort, but it is steadily drying up, wreaking massive ecological havoc. Same with the Owens Valley, which dried up steadily due to the LA Canal, with a secondary one being built in 1972. Even Yosemite, a state park created in 1890 and being put under the National Park Service in 1916, wasn't impervious to this onslaught. On its border was another valley called the Hetch Hetchy, which was also renowned for its beauty. But a 1923 dam filled the valley up as a reservoir for San Francisco. One of these water projects ended in one of the worst failures in American history. A dam finished in 1926 to make another reservoir for Los Angeles burst a couple years after completion. It deluged what is now Santa Clarita in a torrent that took 411 lives. William Mulholland, who'd engineered so much of LA's waterworks, resigned in disgrace since he'd inspected the dam only 12 hours prior. It was completely preventable, but the worst Californian disaster of the early 20th century was not. In 1906, a massive earthquake struck the San Francisco area. Around 3,000 Californians perished in the devastation. To make matters worse, Firefighters trying to stop a fire from spreading through the wreckage set off dynamite to destroy a few buildings, but ended up making matters worse. Despite all the water mains bursting and flooding the streets, the city was on fire. The conflagration makes it impossible to know how many died, but around 80% of the city was incinerated. This secured SoCal's ascendancy. The California economy still revolves around Los Angeles. As fruit and oil flowed eastward, California used that wealth to expand its infrastructure and support systems. They'd created their first university in 1873 at Berkeley, today simply known as Cal. In 1919, they had a southern branch which became UCLA in 1927. This was the beginning of the California University system. It would go through a bunch of reforms in the 1950s, creating a tiered system with full universities called UCs, state universities called CSUs, I returned to San Luis Obispo to get my master's degree from Cal Poly, which is part of the CSU system. Sadly, I had to leave for a PhD program. But in 1960, a series of community colleges was added to this massive system. These are the most prestigious public universities in the world, which currently have 10 UCs, 23 CSUs, and 115 community colleges along with private colleges like Stanford, which was created by California politician and railroad magnate Leland Stanford in 1885, Caltech, founded in 1891 and reorganized in 1920, the University of Southern California, or USC, in 1880, 
Claremont Colleges in 1926, and many more, California's higher education facilities are unrivaled, not just in the U.S., but in the world. It helps that the Mediterranean climate of coastal California is conducive to easy living. Even today, people flock to the beaches, making for a tourist trap, and this would help California survive the next impeding disaster, as in the Great Depression. Before World War I, California was quite isolated from the national economy, but the manufacturing boom during that war brought many fledgling industries to California and connected the state to the national economy. Through the interwar years, oil, fruit, and tourism kept California's economy strong. When the Great Depression struck, the state not only rebuffed its effects, it actually kind of thrived. People sought employment in one of the few places that still had ample jobs. Once the Great Plains topsoil ripped off to form the Dust Bowl, around 300,000 people traveled from the region to California in search of the California dream. Since many came from Oklahoma, they were known as Okies. My grandpa was one of them. This famous photograph is of an Okie as well, named Florence Owens, later Thompson. But most only know her as Migrant Mother, the name of the photo. It was taken near the Dana Adobe in Nipomo, a museum I actually interned at for a semester. And oddly enough, Thompson never received any dividends for her depiction, because Dorothea Lang took the picture for a Farm Security Administration project, which was later used as New Deal propaganda, hence why it's so popular. But Thompson eventually did well for herself, for such was the fortune of Okies coming to California. But this also meant that California had no need for migrant labor, so they pushed for the exclusion of Mexicans from the economy, to the point of deporting many. During World War II, they'd bring back migratory labor through the Bracero program, but they'd reverse course again after the war. Workers also struck numerous times. Nearly 50,000 farm workers protested in a series of strikes, often trying to fight the anti-migratory labor measures pushed against Mexicans. In 1934, longshoremen basically halted shipping across the West Coast for better job security and wages. To break up one in San Francisco, police attacked a barricade, and the ensuing melee, known as Bloody Thursday, left nine dead and more than a thousand injured. It was a high tide of labor unrest, and New Deal laws gave the movement its greatest achievements. The Depression also brought a massive amount of infrastructure building. The Colorado River Compact set in motion plans to build the Hoover Dam, which broke ground in 1931, and the lake it created is still the regulatory watershed for all who use its waters, especially California. The Depression began a massive water project in the Central Valley creating canals for hundreds of miles, numerous hydroelectric dams, and massive irrigation projects on either side, quenching the thirst of millions today. Numerous highways, bridges, and public buildings were created thanks to the New Deal during this time. This includes the Golden Gate Bridge, which finished in 1937. The infrastructure that gave the basis of California's continuing power began during the Great Depression and came to fruition during World War II. Japan attacked in December of 1941. They even bombarded the West Coast a couple of times early in 1942, and attacked or sank several American vessels just offshore. Los Angeles defended against what they thought was an attack one night, but was probably just a weather balloon. For the rest of the war, Californians sufficed without lights while traveling at night. There were some incendiary balloon attacks later in the war, but nothing else of consequence in the state. While the nation fought the Axis powers abroad, California turned inward. Japanese immigrants had faced discrimination for decades. Hatred for Chinese people eventually boiled over to other Asians. In 1913, a law blocked immigrants in California from buying land. Hate clubs were popular throughout the interwar period, but this prejudice came to a climax because of the war. President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. Execute. Order 66. 
which required interning all Japanese, whether Issei, as in first generation immigrants, or native citizens. Around more than a hundred thousand lived out the rest of the war in internment camps, most of whom came from California. Beyond the ignominy of a republic imprisoning its own citizens during a war, purely on the basis of race, many Japanese Americans lost their property, leaving them destitute after the war. Despite such discrimination, they joined the US military in droves straight out of the camps. A truly inspiring record. The war effort bolstered California and guaranteed her ascendancy. She became part of what Roosevelt called the arsenal of democracy. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. The aerospace industry was particularly powerful, with Douglas, Lockheed, and numerous others headquartered there. By the 1920s, one-third of all national flights arrived or departed from the LA area, so it was poised to be the biggest player in a war that hinged on air superiority. Shipbuilding also took off during the war, since the San Francisco and San Diego bays are our best harbors. The army trained up in the Mojave Desert Training Center in order to prepare for Africa. On top of all of that, California's robust higher education system became the nexus of research and development, including the Manhattan Project, which was run by many California professors, and the lab at Los Alamos that was ultimately responsible for building the nuclear bombs was run by Cal, which remained in control all the way until 2006 and still remains in partial control of Los Alamos labs. The California economy was stronger than ever after the war. The military-industrial complex remained a powerful fixture for decades to come, and all the commercial developments afterward were based upon this structure. The master plan for higher education was based on the funding they got from all of this. But perhaps the biggest economic change was a new influx of population. People moved to California in droves after the war, sparking off yet another housing boom. But unlike all the previous ones, this kept going, guaranteeing continuous growth, not only surpassing New York in 1962 and becoming the most populated state, but outstripping everyone else. Even if other states kept their current growth rates, it would take a century for the next closest, as in Texas, to even catch up. Since the post-war housing boom came at a time often remembered as the golden age of capitalism, California benefited most from the most prosperous time in our nation's history. A lot of people could easily afford a car, and with the housing boom, this shaped the future. All new developments were car-centric, as in suburbs. The very shape of suburbia was dependent on this prosperity. People wanted their own white picket fenced slice of heaven, and that Mediterranean climate is unmatched anywhere in the US. To support the car culture of suburbia and connect the nation's car infrastructure for the sake of the military industrial complex, the interstate highway system reshaped cities in favor of suburbia. Highways allowed suburbs to be built further and further out, since people were willing to commute into work. The only limits were mountains, oceans, and water accessibility. Of course, suburbia came at a cost. Rapid deforestation left the hills vulnerable to mudslides. People closer to the remaining forests were vulnerable to ever-present wildfires that have only worsened. And then there was smog. It simply means smoky fog. But by the late 1950s, these events suffocated cities and often led to deaths. LA was particularly bad because the shape of the valley traps pollution. It took until the 1960s that automobiles were blamed, and only in 1975 was the catalytic converter introduced and smog seriously abated. These environmental catastrophes boded a political change in California. It was to become what many call the left coast. A counterculture is emerging, and its nucleus is in California. Many upheavals accompanied that, along with plenty of people and events to contradict the supposedly liberal status the state is famous for. But that will have to wait for the next episode. California is the most powerful state because of these changes. From the railroads, oil, and what the Great Depression and World War II created, California became the center of the military-industrial complex and the golden age of capitalism. 
Her population overtook New York, and Hollywood maintained cultural supremacy. It had plenty of bumps, along with many to come, but the political conflagrations of the 1960s and 70s could always be juxtaposed by how powerful California had become. 